So for the steam engine, we're going to use the Rankine cycle, which is the form of a steam engine that's used in, uh, it's a steam turbine. Uh, this is used in uh, nuclear power plants today, for that matter, in a coal-fired power plant. Uh, it's generally done the same thing. And uh, therefore also in a nuclear-powered um, aircraft carrier, whatnot, we'll be running this. So these are still, steam engines are still uh, major workhorses in the economy today. <clears throat> All right, I'll show you the schematic of how the cycle goes, and then I'll make the PV diagram. So, we've got our hot reservoir here, and we have a cold reservoir there. Really need a taller chalkboard to get all of this on. Okay. Now, let's say we start off taking water and it's run around through the cycle between the hot and the cold reservoirs. We start off by taking liquid water, running it through a pump to compress it up to high pressure. So, water starts off. We'll call this point one. It goes through a pump. Whatever shape the pump looks like. Raises the pressure of the water. Okay. At point two, the water's had the pressure raised. Now it goes into a boiler. Just think of an old steam locomotive with a boiler there. You've got a firebox in uh, to let the heat flow into it from the hot reservoir. Uh, the boiler allows the water to boil at constant pressure. Those are bubbles and a bit of water vapor, steam, and so on coming off of there. Okay. <clears throat> now, you take a mixture of water and steam coming out of the boiler. And because steam takes up a lot more room than water does, than liquid water, um, you have, it's expanded in the boiler. I mean, think about taking a single drop of water, put it on the stove, and it makes a moderately large cloud of steam. So you use that, you run that uh, steam through a turbine, and it pushes against the blades of the turbine, spinning them around, and you can drive an electric generator that way. So it goes through the turbine here, The turbine has these fan blades that are angled, and you've usually got several uh, uh, layers of them turning in opposite directions, or at least that's what it looks like in a, uh, a jet engine, um, a jet plane's turbine. The turbo part of the turbo jet. Okay, these. <clears throat> All right, so there's your turbine. You get work out of this. Now, the gas has wound up lowering its pressure as it goes through the turbine. And you send it into a condenser. And the condenser 
is um, it's going to have the, the tubes that kind of go around uh, to give it a large surface area. A lot of places for the heat, the waste heat to be given off to the cold reservoir. Uh, you could be taking a bunch of pipes that kind of uh, screw around like this and as they go through a bath of water, surrounded by a bath of water. So uh, let's see, this was 0.2, this is 0.3, that's 0.4. Okay, that's the condenser. And then you're back to point one with uh, liquid water again at low pressure. <clears throat> now, without color chalk, it's hard for me to show, but hot, uh, the heat is taken in from the hot reservoir into the boiler. So, I know it's hard to see, but that's QH coming into the system in the boiler. And by the same token, we've got the waste heat, QC, dropped off into the cold reservoir in the condenser. QC there. Okay. And we've got the work being split off in the uh, turbine. All right, that gets us, well, that's actually not a bad drawing there. You know, the front of my artwork on this one. But that's not the point. Uh, the point is, well, what's the PV diagram for this here? We start off at point one here as the water has come out of the condenser and it's about to enter the pump. It's at its lowest volume and pressure. Let's see. Let's just mark that here. Nice loud squeak. The pump takes it uh, pretty much straight up at constant volume, just about. I mean, you will hear, especially among, among engineers, referring to liquids as incompressible fluids. Unlike a gas, which you can, you can take a balloon of air and you can squeeze it, try taking, a, try taking a can of Coke liquid and squeezing it. You're not going to really compress it enough to notice. So that's what the engineers mean by incompressible fluids. Yes, you actually can change the volume by a tiny fraction, but not enough to notice really. So as the pump compresses the water, it goes to high pressure, but the volume stays basically the same. So the pump moves it from point one to point two, just about straight up. In the boiler, we boil it at constant pressure. So we go from point two to point three horizontally. It's a boiler written up there. Going through the turbine, it expands. Uh, it well, it expanded in the boiler as well, but it continues to expand in the turbine, and it lowers the pressure as it pushes against those turbine blades. Now, it goes to the turbine very quickly. So, would this be, considering we've got our two extremes, we have isothermal expansions and we have adiabatic expansions on the two limiting extremes. This is done quickly, so would it be closer to isothermal or adiabatic? Adiabatic. Adiabatic, right meaning that there is essentially no heat flow during this expansion. 
So an adiabatic expansion through the turbine down to the pressure that we started off with. Okay, and then the condenser um, brings it back to small volume. I mean, they, it literally condenses. So it goes from steam back to liquid water at constant pressure. Okay. Notice that from 4 to 1, the condenser is at constant pressure, and from 2 to 3 is also at constant pressure in the boiler. Heat flows into the system here in the boiler. So QH comes in here. And QC, the waste heat, leaves the system through the condenser uh, down here at the bottom. Okay, simple enough, right? We can just take a PV diagram. It makes a nice, you know, we've got one adiabat here, but all the others are straight lines. We can integrate, we can find our work done, the pressure, the, uh, uh, the heat flow here and here, and find the efficiency of it. But this is going to be our goal, find the efficiency of such a, a uh, steam engine. The suppressed smile means that you all know that I have a little butt up my sleeve on this. But do we have an ideal gas running all the way through this here? Why not? I mean, we've got, we got, it's a steam engine. We've got steam close enough to an ideal gas. It's not constantly gas. It's changing. It's transferring. We've got phase changes. phase changes. We've got water here. And for that matter, we've got nasty mixes of water and steam in some of these uh, steps here and here. Well, let's see what we can do. First of all, let me put on here where we have water, where we have where we have pure water, where we have pure steam, and where we've got some mix of the two. So when we run it through the condenser. We've got a mix of the two. And when we get it back down to point one where it is just condensed and is about to be pumped back in, it's just gotten back to being pure water here, or uh, completely liquid. So if you plot out the phase diagrams on this plot here, you get a curve that runs up about like this. Everything to the left and above this curve is liquid water. Now, I'm going to write the labels to this up at the top because I have so many other labels running around here. I don't want to mess it up any more than I have. Uh, actually, I should put liquid water. In physics, when we're running through phase changes with different kinds of molecules, uh, water is often used to refer to H2O, regardless of what the phase is, you know, what phase it's in. You know, liquid water, frozen water, uh, solid water, gaseous water, as opposed to, we actually, in astronomy especially, we refer to other kinds of ices, uh, like methane ice and so on, that you'll find on certain kinds of moons and planets. So, you know, how do we distinguish between water ice? Well, we say water ice. So water is everything in the shaded area over here, just touching that point. Point two, after it's been pumped up to higher pressure, it's definitely liquid water. Now, we tend to use the word steam in common everyday language differently from how we mean it in physics. And to tell you the truth, whenever I've often seen this as written as if the physics use of the word steam is the true meaning of the word steam, and the way we use it in common speech is wrong. It's not true. 
The word steam has been in the English language since Old English, long before we understood anything about chemistry and physics. It's got precedence. So the idea that you've got um, a combination of you know, gaseous water and little water droplets coming out of your tea kettle, and we call that steam, that's perfectly true. It's just that in physics, in chemistry, and maybe some other areas of engineering, um, we have a more specific meaning of it that is different from the normal definition of the word. And that is pure gaseous H2O with no water drops, no liquid water drops mixed in. Here we're going to refer to that as superheated steam. Essentially, um, I think I could probably say dry steam in a sense. All right? Superheated steam. Now, where the superheated steam is on this curve here, on this plot, is a little trickier. It's, oh boy, I really haven't left myself much room. Let me get the water down a little bit. Superheated steam is just this area here, up there and above. It only covers point three and a little bit beyond, but no other points. water there. Well, what about the area of this plot in between the two, in between liquid water and superheated steam? That is what we're going to call saturated water plus steam, a mix of um, water, uh, uh, water droplets and steam, per, and steam per se, in the strictest definition. Okay, so in between these two, uh, where do I have room to write this? Uh, saturated. Between here and here, okay, all the blank areas there. Water plus steam. Okay. Is that clear enough? Yeah. Well, we'll see once we get going with it. So what do we do now? We really want to find the efficiency. So, let's write down the equation for efficiency. One of the first, after we get the, the uh, basic definition of efficiency, the benefit divided by the cost. Well, which we could put as uh, benefit is work, cost is the intake heat, QH. And we can quickly find from the first law of thermodynamics that that also is 1 minus QC over QH. Remember that equation we had there. Now, if we were dealing with a an ideal gas all the way through all four steps of the cycle, we could have solved for QC, solved for QH, plugged them in and found the efficiency. But we've got no such luck when we've got these phase transformations going on. So, what we're going to do instead, we're going to derive QH and QC from the change in enthalpy of the system. Not that I would have expected y'all to just come up with that on your own, but wiser heads who have gone on before us have done this and they found out that that's going to work. So, use the change in enthalpy, delta H. Okay. Recall again equation 1.51. The definition of enthalpy is U plus PV, the system's internal energy plus the product of pressure and volume. That's enthalpy. Now we want the change of enthalpy. Well, we've got three variables on here. It'd be nice if we didn't have to have all three of them changing. Well, if we look here, notice that between steps two and three, 
we've got constant pressure. And from 4 to 1, we've got constant pressure. So if we look at the change of enthalpy here and the change of enthalpy here, we've got pressure is constant, and the change in enthalpy is delta U plus P delta V. When we have constant pressure. Now, delta U. That, uh, that shows up all the time. From the first law of thermodynamics, delta U is P, uh, Q plus W. Okay, we remember that. What kind of work are we doing? Well, in principle, we can have mechanical work, and we can have electrical work, chemical work, all these other kinds of work. In this system, we're just going to have mechanical work going on. So, if work in general is mechanical work plus other work, I think I'm running out of chalkboard. Uh, let's move this over here just a little bit. Well, I'll just put it in this way. Our mechanical work is negative P delta V. And then we're going to add on other work. So minus P delta V plus W sub other. Can't read that. That's what that's saying. And if we're saying that there is no other kind of work being performed, just mechanical, we've got negative P delta V. OK, let's substitute that into the first law, and then the first law into here, and we come up with the change in enthalpy when there's only mechanical work being done, and we've got the pressure being constant. We wind up with, so delta U is Q plus W, that's Q minus P delta V plus P delta V. change in enthalpy at constant pressure, if there's only mechanical work being done, is nothing more than the heat that flows in or out. Constant pressure, no work being done. Okay, so it's got, you know, under restricted cases, this works here. And that's what we can use from steps two to three and from four to one. That means From 2 to 3, so the change in enthalpy from 2 to 3 is, um, if I go from final minus initial enthalpy of point 3 minus the enthalpy of point 2, I get QH, and enthalpy at point 4 minus enthalpy at point 1 is QC. And why did I switch my order here? Here I went final minus initial. Here I did initial minus final. Reason is, is that I want to keep QH and QC both positive. Remember that custom that we do for engines and refrigerators? We want all of the heat flow terms to be positive. OK. Great. Let's put this in here. Now we have. QH and QC in terms of the change of enthalpy. I'd still rather not have to look up enthalpy for every single one of these. And when I'm dealing with liquid water, eh, it's just, it's a bit of a mess there as well. Luckily. See, I wouldn't have even said this if I didn't have a luckily at the end of it. Luckily, I can get rid of the enthalpy at point two in this equation. Turns out it's actually going to be the same as the enthalpy at point one. We're really, really close to it. Now, the reason for this 
Try to think if I should use. Oh, you know what? Does somebody have this part written down here? Okay, and the and way it goes down. This way I can keep it all on the same screen as what I'm doing here. Okay. Since enthalpy is U plus PV, the change in enthalpy, if the pressure is, if the pressure is changing as we pump the water up to high pressure from 0.1 to 0.2, pressure is increasing, I mean that's the whole point. Nothing else is changing really here. So let's not assume constant pressure. So change in enthalpy is the change in U plus the change in PV. Now remember, if P were constant, I could pull it outside this delta, but it's not here. So going from point two, uh, from one to two, so final enthalpy minus initial, H2 minus H1, is U2 minus U1 plus P2V2 minus P1V1. It turns out, look at these here first. At point one, we had just, we're on the phase boundary of water and steam. We can, now, it is a liquid here, but we can also look at the, uh, the, the gaseous forms of these, which we'll do in the steam tables later. But we got a liquid there. As we pump it up, we are keeping it solidly within the uh, liquid phase. It turns out that pressure times volume for liquids is really small. You're dealing with pretty low pressures, and the volume of water is generally treated in a lot of these things is basically zero compared to the gas. Gas steam takes up an enormously large amount of room compared to the water, liquid water, came from. So that and that individually are pretty close to zero, at least negligible. The difference between the two is also small. Now here, so this is for liquids, those two are individually zero, or close to it. The change in the internal energy, the thermal energy of this water as we increase the pressure that's proportional to the change in temperature, which is not really that much. Um, pumping it adds very little energy to liquid water. So the difference in the energy here and here is about zero. So H2 minus H1 is about equal to zero. Therefore, H2 is about equal to H1. The enthalpy doesn't change by much as we pump the liquid water up to high pressure. And it's going to be a lot easier if we use H1 here instead of H2. So I'll put that in. 1 minus H4 minus H1 over H3 minus H1. OK. And let me put this is about equal to, but close enough for our purposes. Okay, now we're set to learn steam tables. There's no cheer. Okay, Lisa, there, thank you, all right. Steam tables, which you didn't even know existed until right now, and now you get to learn them. So, I actually found a, a, an old book of steam engine design at an antique bookstore in Huntington that had, it was just filled with steam tables. And I was kind of, after teaching this, I was kind of curious to get a copy of that, you know, see what the old steam engine engineers um, dealt with in designing these things. Okay. So. I'm going to rewrite our efficiency equation in terms of enthalpy.
Let's take on an example here. I'm going to use the one in the book. We need to know a few things first. The pressures used in this, uh, in this engine. The minimum pressure when we've got uh, steps four and one running through the condenser, we're going to use a low pressure of 0 0.023 bar. Remember that one bar is close to normal atmospheric pressure. So this is very low pressure here. Um, and we will, after it goes through the pump, goes into the boiler, it's going to be at a high pressure of 600, I'm oh, sorry, 300 bars. Okay, 300 bars um, with the high temperature of 600 degrees Celsius. Now, for this one, you actually have to know what the high temperature uh, is on it, because that temperature changes as it goes to the boiler. Do you need to know where that's kept in the Kelvin? No. Okay. Not in this case. Uh, we're really just using it to look up numbers. OK, uh, so when it, when it becomes superheated steam in uh, step three, It'll be at the maximum temperature. Okay. So, our first thing is going to be to start off at step one as the water has just come out of the condenser and is about to run into the pump. So, we're going to be at our minimum pressure and our low temperature. And uh, you can simply look up on these tables, uh, and you'll find that your temperature, that point one, is also going to be up. Sorry, the temperature at which it would boil will be in the tables. If you look at the pressure, you'll find the boiling temperature. Just 20 degrees Celsius, room temperature. At very low pressure, water boils at a lower temperature. Which, by the way, is why if you look in the, a cookbook, and they give high altitude recipes, versions of the recipes, if you're up in Denver, Colorado, or somewhere else on top of the mountain, the air pressure is lower. Water boils at a lower temperature. Therefore, you can't get, if you've got you know, some beans in the, uh, in the uh, saucepan and boiling it water, in the water, that water's at a constant temperature while it's boiling. But if you're up at a high altitude, uh, at high elevation, it's boiling at a lower temperature. It's not cooking as fast than if you're down at sea level. So you have to increase the cooking times at high, uh, high elevation. OK, given those things there, we'll be able to find that. OK, point one, as it comes out of the condenser and is about to run into the pump, is water only. But it's on the phase boundary of being uh, saturated water and steam. Same conditions, maybe I should say. As we get up to point three, and B, we have point one, two, three, and four. And there's the water, superheated steam, and saturated water and steam is in between. Okay. All right, uh, point Two, we don't care about on this because we've eliminated it. Point three is superheated steam, so steam only. And point four is saturated water and steam.
Knowing these conditions it's under tells us which table we're going to look in. We've got two tables. We have a saturated water and steam table, and we have a superheated steam table. These are given in the book on page 136. 136 it is. Okay. <clears throat> First thing to do, let's find the enthalpy at point one as it is just about to go into the pump. We use the saturated water and steam table. which in this textbook is table 4.1. What do we need to find it? Well, we use, let's see, we're given the minimum pressure. So given the minimum pressure of 0.023 bars, uh, which gives us the boiling temperature at that pressure as well. Notice that those two are just, they're listed next to each other. If you know one, you know the other. Okay, so you look down to this row that has a pressure of 0.023 bars and a boiling temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, and what you get from that, uh, you want to look up the, uh, uh, let's see here, you want to look up the Enthalpy of water, H sub water, for this temperature. By the way, why do we know that the uh, temperature we're using here is the boiling temperature? Because we're on the boundary of the phase diagram. So the water at that tip point is at the same temperature as the steam at that point. It's because it's right at the boiling point. It's condensing, but that's the boiling temperature. Okay, use that. So uh, we've got we look in the row that's got uh, 20 degrees and 0.023 bars. We want to find enthalpy of water at that temperature. And what is the enthalpy of water at that temperature? 84 kilojoules per kilogram of water. Now, they, they say all of these numbers are for one kilogram of fluid. Uh, so it's, I actually tend to write it in there you know, per kilogram. But. Okay, so we've got that. H water, we look it up and we get 84 kilojoules. So that means H1 is 84 kilojoules per kilogram. Per kilogram of water and steam. Great, we got our first point. Three more. Two more to go. Now, to find it at point three, which is a superheated steam, now we're going to look at table 4.2. So, the same page. In this case, we use the maximum temperature and pressure. For superheated steam. Now, this table is a little more complicated because you've got pressures at different temperatures. The, uh, each row in this table gives you the conditions for different pressures, but each column is at a different temperature. Now, the reason we didn't need that for the saturated table was that we were on this 
uh, phase boundary. And so temperature and pressure went together when you're on that boundary. Here, we can have different pressures and temperatures because we're dealing purely with steam, not with any uh, possibility of breathing. Okay, that's why we needed to know the maximum temperature. So, read out the row that has uh, a pressure of 300 bars and the column that has 600 degrees Kelvin, a uh, 600 degrees Celsius, I mean, and you come up with two numbers. If you look there, you notice that the top number in the pair is the enthalpy in kilojoules, and the bottom number is the entropy in kilojoules per degree Kelvin. Okay, so you go down to the correct row, and you go over to the right, correct column, and when they intersect, we find the enthalpy is 3,444 kilojoules, and really this is all per kilogram. Okay. Great, now we've got two points. To find the, ent the enthalpy at point four, it's trickier. Because we're going down into this phase change here. Um, as, we, as it goes to the turbine, we start getting uh, water droplets mixed in with the steam. We don't have a separate table just for that condition. What we do is we have to do some interpolation. Move the camera over. Okay, now, when we went from point three to point four, going through the turbine, this is an adiabatic transformation. Since so three to four is adiabatic. Adiabatic means that there is no flow of heat. Q equals zero. Since for quasi-static transformation, delta S is Q over T. And since this is adiabatic, Q equals zero, which means delta S equals zero, which means there's no change in the entropy as we take the steam through the turbine. Since there's no change in the entropy, then the entropy at point four is the same as the entropy at point three. And we have the entropy at point three on the table. So the entropy at this point is equal to the entropy at point three. So we, from the table 4.2, we just looked up, we found the enthalpy, and right below that you look up and you'll notice that the entropy at point three, and therefore point four, is 6.233 kiloj uh, yeah, kilojoules per Kelvin, and also per kilogram of fluid. Okay. Well, how does that help us find the enthalpy at point four? All right. This is, I don't think it's not that bad, but there's a little bit of a making sure you're keeping, uh, keeping things straight. You use the the saturated water and steam table, table 4.1, which has, if you take a look on the last two columns, you've got the entropy of water for the conditions there, and the entropy of steam under those conditions. What we need, as we go from point four back to point one, as we take it through the condenser, is that the, um, Make sure that I'm reading this correctly. The tip up, the temperature, as we take it through the condenser, is uh, staying the same, 20 degrees Celsius, because it's going through a phase change. Keep in mind, temperature doesn't change through a phase change. So the we find the entropy of the water and the steam in the saturated water and steam table, 4.1 using the minimum pressure, and we interpret it. Okay. S sub water at point four 
is equal to, and we're using pressure sub minimum, so that same row, 0.023 bars, uh, entropy of water is 0.297, and I'll, I'll leave off the units for now, and the entropy of steam at 0.4, which is same temperature as, as the, uh, and pressure as uh, 0.1, 1023 bars, we get 8.667 in the same units. What we need to do is that if we can find out what, okay, here's the way to explain it. Here is the entropy of our, of our mix of gas at a water and steam at 0.4. 6.233. We've got to make that much entropy out of some amount of water and some amount of steam. We interpolate between these two to find what fraction of water and steam has a total entropy of 6.233. Okay? Water has a very low entropy, steam has a very high entropy. We need some mix of the two to get in between. Have you all interpolated things before? Okay, good. I'll teach you something new today. All right. Um, to interpolate means to find out what fraction of two things gives you the right mix. Okay. Let's see. I've got room on the chalkboard here. All right. Um, interpolation. That can be looked at as <clears throat> if you've got two points on a an x uh, y versus x plot. Let's see. The in, the enthalpy I've got a point for is made up of uh, some enthalpy of water. I'll use W for water, and some enthalpy of steam H sub S for steam. And if I were to have the system made all of water. So I'm going to plot enthalpy, total enthalpy for the system versus the fraction of steam that I've got. I don't know what fraction of water and steam I have at point 0.4, but I'll find that. So F sub S is the fraction of steam. You apologize, uh, I'll apologize for using a lot of new symbols and subscripts. If it's all water, it's 0% steam. If it's all steam, I'm at 1 there. Now, if I've got only water, then my enthalpy at point 0.4 would be whatever the enthalpy of water is. But if I had all steam, my enthalpy at point 0.4 would be whatever the enthalpy of steam is. And as I increase the fraction of steam, I increase the enthalpy uh, to be going up to that maximum value. So interpolating is finding out if I know my actual uh, I know what my entropy is, and I know the entropy of water and steam separately. So I can use this to find, I can interpolate to find the fraction of steam that I've got. Then using that, I can find out what fraction of steam I actually have and read off the actual entropy that I've got there. That's interpolation. Okay. So I'm going to write this out as the, the thing is I, I wound up doing kind of a brute force approach to this without making it, I used a lot more steps because each, I can make each step be kind of clear why you set it up, but it comes up with a lot of steps. I'm running up without, without a whole lot of chalkboard here. Um, I'll just take it through then and you can look over it. So, the enthalpy of 0.4 is whatever fraction of water I've got times the enthalpy of water alone, plus whatever fraction of steam I've got times the enthalpy of steam alone. Clear enough? Hopefully. The fraction of water plus the fraction of steam must be equal to 1. 
So the fraction of water I've got is 1 minus the fraction of steam. So I can get rid of the fraction of water here and then rewrite this. Doing a little bit of algebra, which I will skip over, that leads me to, I substitute that in. These two have to add up to 1, or 100%. Uh, and from a little bit of algebra, I find out that the enthalpy at point 4 must be the enthalpy of water at point 4, plus whatever fraction of steam I've got there, times the enthalpy of steam at point 4 minus the enthalpy of water at point 4. And then that's just going to be some algebra. Okay. Now, but I don't know what fraction of steam I've got, so I use what I know about the entropy. I've got the same fraction of water and steam, whether I'm looking at the entropy or the enthalpy. Uh, this water and steam are what they are. Let's see here. The entropy of my water, uh, my entropy at point three is my entropy at point four, because we go through a, uh, an adiabatic transformation. Now, entropy at point four is, just like this equation here, entropy of water at point four plus some fraction of steam times the difference in the entropy of steam at point four minus the entropy of water at point four. So if I solve for the fraction of steam here, and I know these others, I wind up getting total entropy at point three and point four. That's the same thing. Uh, I've already labeled it as my entropy at point four. That's fine. Minus the entropy of water at point four divided by entropy of steam at point 4 minus the entropy of water at point 4. I plug in the numbers. This is 6.233, that's 0 0.297. This is 8.667, and that's 0 0.297. And I get my fraction of steam is 71%. Honestly, you'll have to sit down and try to work this out to get the interpolation. This is the trickiest part. The math is not hard, it's just the setup, keeping things straight. Once I get know that, I put in 71% here, 0.71. I put in what the table tells me for the enthalpies of steam and water at 0.4, and the enthalpy of water at 0.4 here as well. And I get, let's see, entropy of water is 84 plus 0 0.71, 71% of 2,538 is the entropy of steam minus the entropy of water is 84. I solve that and I get 18.6. So remember, to find what fraction of steam we've got, we use the entropies, because we know the entropy at point four. And if you look at um, the saturated water and steam table uh, for 20 degrees Celsius and 0.023 bars, you get the entropy of water, the entropy of steam. Plug those in, you find the fraction of steam. Now you go up here and use this to find the enthalpy. You know the enthalpy at point four was uh, why did I do entropy? Oh, actually I didn't know that. Sorry. The enthalpy of water and the enthalpy of steam are given on that same line. The second and the sorry, the third and fourth columns, H sub water, H sub steam. Plug those in. Now you got total enthalpy at point four. Phew. Now. Kilojoules per kilogram. H1, H3, H4. 
put them into our efficiency equation, oops, I'll just go back to here, good. And what we get One minus 1826 minus 84 over 3444 minus 84 again. And we get an efficiency of 0 0.48, which is an efficiency of 48%. Followed exactly what I did in every step. Go over how to interpolate. Like I said, it, I couldn't show all the steps just for a lack of space and honestly time, which I'm way over. Um, but you can work out interpolation if you if you think it through a few times. I'm looking what I wrote up there. Keep in mind. key thing is, if you've got some fraction of water and some fraction of steam, the property of the mix of those two will be, if you've got, uh, let's see, whatever frac if you've got a, some enthalpy due to water and some enthalpy due to steam, you multiply the enthalpy of water by the fraction of water you've got, and you add it to the enthalpy of steam times the fraction of steam you've got and that gives you your enthalpy of that mixture. And if you write this out for enthalpy and you write it out for entropy, which you already know the entropy, that's, the, that's why we can use that. Then you can find the fraction of steam in terms of, uh, from the entropy and put it back into here and solve for the entropy. And use the fact that Fraction of steam plus the fraction of water must be equal to one. So you have two equations and two unknowns, and you can solve them.